Good afternoon. This is Beth Wadham from the Association for Contemplative Mind in Higher Education. Welcome to our May webinar, No Time to Think, the American University and its anti, in parentheses, contemplative roots, with David Levy, professor of the Information School at the University of Washington in Seattle. The presentation will be about 40 minutes long, and then we'll have 15 to 20 minutes for your questions and comments. So we're delighted to be with David Levy on the West Coast, extending our geographical reach this afternoon. The title of his talk, No Time to Think, strikes a responsive chord. Over 75 people have registered for this webinar, and it seems to offer a way into this idea of contemplative education, even for newcomers, because nearly everyone is aware of the climate of distraction and information overload at colleges and universities. David has an online Google Tech Talk um, with the same title from 2008, and it's been viewed over 72,000 times. This is his first webinar, I believe, and I'm interested in learning how he views this new information technology. David was one of the Center's Contemplative Practice Fellows in 2006, during which he created Information and Contemplation a course that asks students to bring contemplative awareness to their use of information technology, their cell phones, emailing, use of the web, and from those discoveries to create conscious guidelines as a means of dealing with information overload, fragmented attention, and the accelerated pace of life. David comes from a background in computer science and information technology, earned his PhD from Stanford University, and then, in an intriguing move, he went to London for two years for an intensive study of calligraphy and bookbinding and earned a diploma from the Roehampton Institute. He returned to the States to conduct research at Xerox Park for more than 15 years before joining the Information School at the University in 2001. David opened our first um, association conference last year with his talk, Head, Heart, and Hand, cultivating the contemplative in higher education. And ever since, we've been eager to hear from him again. So thanks so much for offering this presentation today, David. And now I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Beth, for that um, lovely introduction. And um, thanks to all of you who are in attendance, even though I can't see you. Um, as you can see, I've titled my talk, uh, No Time to Think. This is a phrase I've been using. Um, as you heard from what Beth was just saying, uh, a phrase I've been using in recent years to characterize a troubling aspect of our lives today. I'm very concerned about the loss of time for reflection in the culture generally, as life continues to accelerate with no end in sight. But I'm especially concerned about what's happening in this regard in our universities, which we might think of as our culture's think tanks. In this talk, I want to explore the roots of this problem which I locate um, in our industrial era ideas about life and education. But at the same time, I want to suggest that modern higher education, insofar as it acknowledges a, a, an inheritance and a debt um, to Greek and Roman culture, can also legitimately claim to have roots in contemplative practice and pedagogy. So my, my larger message will be really, in the end, a positive one, that the loss of time to think is becoming so extreme and so obvious that we're actually well poised to bring the contemplative back into higher education. So let me start by saying a little bit about myself. Um, you heard some of this from Beth already, but um, I feel that in a way over the last 30 years or so that I really have lived a life in both the fast world and the slow world, where those phrases, fast world and slow world, come from uh, something that Thomas Friedman wrote um, a decade ago. On the one hand, I've lived in the fast world of high tech with, as you heard, a PhD in computer science and being a researcher at a quite famous um, a high tech think tank. But at the same time, these, these decades, these 30 years or so, have been a time of exploring calligraphy and bookbinding um, an ongoing meditation practice, and also in more recent years, um, the practice of Aikido. So that I feel that I really have been weaving together a life in the fast world of high tech and the slow world of craft and contemplation. 
Now, as a result of living in, in, in some sense, in tension in these two, in these two worlds, um, certain questions have arisen for me um, about how to live that have become not only part of my own approach to life um, individually and personally, but have also become the subject of my own, um, my own study. Um, and, and in particular, there are really two questions that have arisen for me over the last 15 years that I think of as, as motivating questions for me. Um, it was in the early to mid-1990s, a time when cell phones, call waiting, the internet, and email were becoming prominent public phenomena, that I started noticing something kind of curious, um, that these technologies, cell phones and so on, which were so clearly being sold as tools to help us connect, also seem to be disconnecting us from one another and from ourselves. So that more than 15 years ago, I started asking, well, what's going on here? And how can we understand the relationship, um, the, the tension between connecting and disconnecting that seems to be the case with these technologies? And then in the year 2000, 2001, was when I made the move from, um, from my life at Xerox Park to a first academic job at the University of Washington, um, moving from I, what I came to feel was um, moving from a think tank to a no think tank, where I discovered that I really had very little time anymore for some of the practices that were, had been such a central part of my life, reading and writing and thinking. And I was really led to ask, um, well, what's happening here? <clears throat> And so it was that basically about 10 years ago, having gone from a think tank to a no think tank, and having been away from the academy for 20 years while everything had been speeding up, I, I really started to question what was happening and try, and try to understand why it was happening. And, and the way that I posed the question to myself um, in, these, in these first years was um, with the following seeming paradox. How is it that we seem to have less time to think now than ever before at exactly the same time that we have now created the most remarkable tools for scholarship and learning perhaps the world has ever known, including the tools that we're using right now um, for this webinar? The question became all the more interesting and perplexing to me when, as a computer scientist, I realized that the man who first conceived of hypertext this is the ability that we use every day now to link one piece of information to another. And the person, who, so the person who conceived of hypertext and who is also considered to be the grandfather of the World Wide Web, um, that he envisioned a new generation of information tools that would give people more time to think, that would actually give people more time for creative thought. The person in question was this man pictured on this slide, Vannevar Bush, um, who was a famous engineer, university administrator and technocrat who in 1945 wrote a seminal article in the Atlantic Monthly called As We May Think, in which he imagined this whole future generation of technologies that would, um, he felt, solve the looming problem of, of information overload and give people more time to think. Um, so what went wrong? Well, I've come to locate the source of the problem. Um, in our industrial era attitudes and practices. Um, as we're all pretty aware, since the Industrial Revolution, that is over the last 100 to 150 years, the West has had what has at times seemed to be an almost single-minded devotion to faster, more efficient, and more abundant production and consumption. I've come to call this attitude or philosophy of life, which is essentially the underlying philosophy of modern capitalism, I've come to call it more, faster, better. And one of the things that I came to understand as I explored this um, uh, with uh, the help in particular of a book by James Benninger, a communications theorist, who wrote the book The Control Revolution in 1986, that the, that, uh, the West's progress in pushing production and consumption faster and faster required uh, the ongoing development of new information technologies from the telegraph, and uh, telephone, all the way to the technologies that we've been using. And the role of these new information technologies has been both to produce more products, 
like newspapers and books and now web pages, but also um, to be used as control agents that would help, um, uh, help people manage the accelerating economy. The result then of this 100 to 150 years of acceleration is what James Glick, the author of the book Faster in 1999, has called the acceleration of just about everything. And indeed, um, the very phenomena that 15 years ago that I was starting to puzzle about, information overload, extreme busyness, the acceleration, and the fragmentation of our attention, all of these, I think, I have come to believe, can be understood um, as a way that information technologies have been used to partner with our philosophy and with our economic system to push things faster and faster. Um, part of the reason for, for framing um, it in, in this way is to, is to suggest that the phenomena that we are experiencing today are in some sense the continuation of what has been happening for more than 100 years and that our cell phones and our web pages and our texting and all of these things are, while in, in fact huge accelerators, they are really just the latest manifestation um, of, the, of this phenomenon. The Norwegian anthropologist Thomas Erikson has made what I think is a very useful contribution to the analysis I've just been giving you. Um, in a book he wrote in 2001 called The Tyranny of the Moment, he says the following, <clears throat> when fast and slow time meet, fast time wins. This is why one never gets the important things done, because there's always something else one has to do first. Naturally, we'll always tend to do the most urgent tasks first. In this way, the slow and long-term activities lose out. In an age when the distinctions between work and leisure are being erased, and efficiency seems to be the only value in economics, politics, and research. This is really bad news for things like thorough, far-sighted work, play, and long-term love relationships. But it's also, of course, really bad news for thinking. Because thinking, deep thinking, reflective thinking, contemplative thinking is itself a slow time activity. It's something that can't be rushed or scheduled. And in a world dominated by factory-oriented notions of productivity, thinking, the kind of thinking that I think everyone who's listening to this uh, webinar recognizes and cares about, real deep, real deep thinking in our factory-oriented um, way of living is simply viewed as a luxury that can't be justified. And I've come to feel that increasingly can't be justified or acknowledged um, even in the academy. And so I come back to the question that I originally posed. How is it we have less time to think than ever before? Now that we have the most remarkable tools, perhaps the world has ever known for scholarship and learning. And my answer is because our more, faster, better philosophy privileges speedy, efficient production over slower, more contemplative, and more receptive modes of engagement. And this is true as much so, this is as much so in our, the universities, our think tanks, as in the rest of the culture. And so I want to turn now in the next section of this talk to look specifically, uh, but briefly, at the history of American higher education to see some of the effect that this more faster, better philosophy has had. I used to say, in the first couple of years when I had come back to the academy. I used to say something like, you know, universities really should be leading the culture rather than mirroring, mirroring it. Why are we simply buying into the acceleration and the overload rather than trying to find another way? But it took me doing more reading, research, and thinking. Um, and in particular, I would point to, uh, uh, people to David Noble's 1979 book, America by Design. Um, it took more research and reading for me to discover something quite important for at least my own understanding. Um, I certainly knew that the engineers a hundred years ago had designed the industrial machines, that they had designed the factory system of production in which the um, 
industrial machines were embedded. And I even knew from some of my earlier research and work um, on my book, Scrolling Forward, that the same um, engineers, or at least the same professional class of engineers, had also been responsible for um, the creation of the modern corporation. What I didn't know until I read David Noble's book, America by Design, was that these same engineers had a strong hand in creating the modern university. Indeed, for these engineers a hundred years ago, the university was, like the corporation, just another kind of machine to be designed and tuned to run efficiently. Um, there are many, many um, examples of, of 100 years ago of, of this engineering mentality. Here, for example, is Frederick Bishop, who at the time in 1911 was dean of the College of Engineering, who said, an educational institution resembles in some respects a manufacturing concern. The goods produced must be of such design, finish, material, etc as to satisfy its patrons. Likewise, the graduates of educational institutions must meet the requirements of the concerns which are to employ them. Now, as it happens, one of the most interesting and enlightening examples of this genre that I came across was this report um, <clears throat> called Academic and Industrial Efficiency, um, which was published by the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching in 1910. Uh, and by the way, the University of Washington actually has a copy, so I'm photographing in my backyard here um, the copy that, um, um, that I've got out on loan. Um, the author of this report, Morris Llewellyn Cook, was a disciple of the famous efficiency expert Frederick Taylor. Cook had apparently been asked by the Carnegie Foundation to bring his expertise in industrial efficiency to bear in evaluating the operations of American colleges and universities. Cook focused, focused in particular on the physics departments in eight American and Canadian universities, including Harvard, MIT, and the University of Toronto. His intention was to show how techniques for measurement, standardization, and accountability that had been developed for efficient production within factories and corporations could be applied, and further should be applied, in institutions of higher learning. The report is filled with fascinating quotes and suggestions about how universities could be made more efficient and productive. And in a section very aptly titled, The College Producer, sorry, The College Teacher as Producer, Cook suggests that until efficiency as used, is used as the sole standard for the teaching profession, as it is coming to be used practically in all other walks of life, any goal satisfactory alike to the community and to the teacher will be difficult of attainment. And he goes on to say, in the same vein, if the same standards of efficiency are to be applied to college teachers as are applied elsewhere, it will mean that when a man has ceased to be efficient, he must be retired, as he would in any other line of work, or if he no longer performs a given function in an efficient manner, that he be relieved, excuse me, that he be relieved of this function. Now, as it happens, um, Cook's ideas did not go unchallenged. Um, to give you one example, an article in the Atlantic Monthly the next year, that is in 1911, written by a man named Henry Davis Bushnell, directly addressed and attacked um, Cook's ideas. And it too is filled with just wonderful, powerful quotes like the following. Um, Bushnell says, we will gladly see gardeners and janitors, bookkeepers and others who carry on the true business machinery of the university caused to labor under conditions of the least waste and the greatest efficiency. But never, he goes on, never with equanimity can we grant that there exists a parallel, an analogy between those, between the processes of turning out steel rails and those of turning out men of the widely diversified capacities of our AB degree holders. And he goes on. He goes on to suggest that no right-thinking person should agree that every hour that the student or the professor occupies, and listen to this phrase, two square feet of lecture room space, he must be expected to produce so many dollars worth of lecture room professor student hours worth of education in money value. Produce, 
he seems to thunder uh, from the page. That is not what he is there for, and that is what makes the fallacy in the argument apparent. Industrial methods of efficiency look to the production of a commodity at, least, at the least expense for the greatest profit. All is subordinated to that theory. And so it's clear from just these few examples, many more of which could be given, that in the formative period 100 years ago where the modern university, the modern American university was um, being created, that engineering had a highly visible influence on the university and in two areas. One was the question of subject matter, the, you know, the age-old debate about liberal versus prof professional and vocational education, with the engineers clearly saying, um, as, and here's a, a famous quote from Andrew Carnegie, um, that the liberal arts are nothing more than learning a little about the barbarous and petty squabbles of the far distant past or trying to master languages which are dead. So on the one hand, you have that engineering mentality saying there's no real value in a liberal education. And at the same time, you have this engineering mentality suggesting that future, that, that the new um, universities and colleges should be organized and measured in terms of factory notions of output and accomplishment. As a side note, I want to suggest that it's occurred to me that there would be a really inter interesting dissertation for somebody to do on the history of the CV. Because what is the CV, especially in, 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 in the academy, but a record of one's um, factory-oriented or productivity? So where are we today, 100 years later? Well. Um, in one area, the engineers have still not yet won. Um, the liberal arts continue on, although we continue to see a parade of books like this one, very interesting book that, that I read um, in the last year or two by Donahue called The Last Professors, that continues to worry that the liberal arts are on the way out, but they aren't yet. On the other hand, it does seem like the, um, the engineers have won um, over the last hundred years in a couple of really important ways. One is that structurally, even the liberal arts colleges are structured and measured according to notions of academic efficiency, uh, according to notions of, of productivity and efficiency and so on. And the other way that I think the engineering mentality has won is that the feverish pace of production, um, the, the, the speed up that we've been seeing over the last hundred years is, without question in my mind, um, limiting the time to think and the time for contemplative inquiry. Um, even more dramatic in some ways is what, what's been happening over the last decade um, as this kind of more faster better attitude is pushed into lower and lower grades. I, land, I learned, for example, that during the last decade more and more elementary school districts are eliminating recess from, for elementary school students uh, under the um, assumption that um, that they're not going to get to have recess when they go out into the big information world, and so they need to learn to suck it up and get used to essentially doing things that are only um, productive in this more limited sense. And even more troubling is this report that came out just in the last year, kindergarten, uh, Crisis in the Kindergarten, Why Children Need to Play in School, which is suggesting that, quote, children now spend far more time being taught and tested on literacy and math skills in, that is children in kindergarten, than they do learning through play and exploration, exercising their bodies and using their imaginations. In other words, that the very practices that give us the, the quiet, the body orientation, the openness to creative possibilities, those very um, ideas are, are, are seen to be increasingly irrelevant to a society that is obsessed with a narrow notion of, of, of production. Now, in a few minutes, I'm going to tell you, I don't want this to sound like it's all bad news, because when I come to the end of my talk, I'm going to suggest that there's actually something quite positive in this development. But before I get to that part of the story, I want to switch gears and explore briefly how today's academy can genuinely claim roots in contemplative practices and perspectives. In other words, that we are in a position now to argue that right going back to the roots 
of, of Western um, um, higher education in Greek and Roman philosophy. There are genuine contemplative roots and practices that need to be reclaimed. Um, we all know that, um, that the modern university um, bears witness to its Greek and Roman ancestry in a variety of ways in our columned um, uh, um, uh, architecture, um, even in the name the academy, which is a reference, uh, direct reference back to Plato's uh, school of philosophy, in our Socratic methods of teaching and learning, in our attention to certain subject matters in canonical texts, including the great philosophical works, and even in our devotion to the liberal arts, which is a direct, direct reference back to Greek and Roman ideas that there are certain practices um, that are not servile but are free that we devote ourselves to because they are the highest uh, practices um, that we human beings are capable of. So we know all of this, but, but as a result of research, scholarship that's been done in recent decades, we're now in a position to, to know um, much more clearly, thanks to the work of the French historian Pierre Adot, that Greek and Roman philosophy not only, um, <coughs> excuse me, not only um, debated the right way to live, but incorporated a variety of contemplative practices, perspe perspectives, and pedagogy that were meant to train the student um, and to transform them. So who's Pierre Adot? He was born in 1922. He's held the chair of history and Greek and Roman thought at the Collège de France. He's a very eminent philosopher. And some of the works that are most important to, to what I have to say now, we're, we're lucky enough to find translated into English, such as Philosophy as a Way of Life in 1995, and What is Ancient Philosophy in 2002. Um, and what Ado has done in these uh, wonderful works is to demonstrate that the Greek schools, the Greek schools of philosophy, were actually spiritual communities that were concerned with radical human growth and transformation. In other words, philosophy wasn't simply a theoretical construct, but as he says, a method for training people to live and to look at the world in a new way. The philosopher's aim was to teach people, was to inform them, not just to form them, to help them uh, conduct a, a, a valid, a genuine search for wisdom. And most crucial to those of us who are part of the extended community uh, in the, uh, as part of the Center for Contemplative Mind, that this path of training and learning in the, in the philosophy schools um, involved and included very fundamentally practices like breathing exercises, meditations on death, examinations of conscience, contemplation of nature, all of which Ado suggests had a central feature which was attention to the present moment. Um, naturally, I mean, this is very exciting because so many of us have been exploring these practices for ourselves and also increasingly in the classroom. Um, Ado has a wonderful quote from the Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius, where Aurelius, Marcus Aurelius says, everywhere and at all times it, it is up to you to rejoice piously at what is occurring at the present moment, to conduct yourself with justice toward the people who are present here and now, and to apply rules of discernment to your present circumstances. So notice what's so exciting, to me at least, about this discovery through this scholarship is that it means that those of us who are bringing contemplative practices back into the academy can say, well, we're not, not just incorporating practices from the East, but we're actually going legitimately back to the very roots of Western education in the attempt to reclaim practices that have been lost along the way. The question then, of course, arises, well, why have they been lost along the way? And Ado, uh, he has an interesting argument longer than I, than I want to try to fully summarize here. But he basically suggests that in the Middle Ages in particular, that Christianity adopted the, the spiritual practices, the contemplative practices of philosophy as their own, and then left to philosophy the remainder which was conceptual and intellectual discourse. So that there was a split where philosophy gave up its roots in contemplative practice and ended up being what we now recognize as the heart 
of philosophical study and discourse in the West now, which is um, intellectual debate and discussion. Um, and an Israeli-American philosopher named Richard Schusterman has also been writing in the same territory, and he suggests that the liberal arts more broadly, in a similar vein, have given up, have disowned the body, um, and, and given up um, that dimension of the exploration of, of, of life and death for more conceptual and more text-based um, investigations. Okay, so where do we go from here? Um, that's really um, where I want to end up in this talk. I've given you a sense of these, basically these two different sets of roots. Um, on the one hand, we have um, um, a, a direct inheritance from industrial culture, and on the other hand, we have a very much reduced, um, 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 a very much reduced inheritance of, the, of contemplative practices from ancient times. Um, and this gives me um, a real feeling of excitement and even confidence that we are positioned at an excellent moment to engage in the practices that, that so many of our, uh, us are now engaged in. And this is what I, what I mean by that. Why is this such an excellent moment? Because a hundred years after the universities, the modern university was founded on its more, beta, more faster, better principles, we are now very clearly in a position to see the destructive side of that. We are, I mean, it's, it's clear for anybody who can slow down and step back that our, that, that our universities are so caught up in more, faster, better that we don't have time to think in the deeper contemplative sense. And what's more, that we're not doing a good job of teaching our students how to do that. We can finally see that the, the, the machinery if you like, that the engineers set up a hundred years ago. It had flaws in it then, and its flaws are even more evident now that we're running this machine at speeds that those engineers never imagined in the first place. At the same time, many of us are lucky enough to have been studying um, contemplative practices, many of them coming from the East, um, for years if not decades. So we are in a position now when we, when we, are, when we look at the scholarship that that, that Addo and Schusterman and others have been doing. We're in a position to understand in a kind of first-person way what these ancient Greek and Roman practices were and what they were for. So we're in a better position than ever before to make the broader argument for the next phase of, of higher education's development that, we, that it's time for us to recover part of the original vision that set higher education in the West on, on, on its current course, and that it's time for us to correct the problems that were created by our industrial era envisioning of these practices. <clears throat> so what is the agenda here? Well, of course, all of us, um, I'm sure all of you who are listening, you each have your own version of an agenda about how you're trying to move these ideas forward. I'm just going to say in one slide what, how I understand the work that I'm doing. Um, as part of this larger um, endeavor that we are, we are now trying to practice. Probably the first and the, and the most important step in this agenda for me is the discovery and recovery of what I call here forms of present-oriented receptivity. What are the practices that I personally need and that I can offer students and others that will allow them to counteract the, the radical instrumentality that has us rushing forward so quickly that we are barely in touch with the present moment. What are these practices which are about receiving and being present? And then the next step is how do we understand what it takes and what it looks like to bring these forms of receptivity specifically into scholarship and teaching and learning? I mean, clearly thinking, reading, and writing at their very best are receptive, deeply receptive and contemplative practices. How do we understand those? How do we practice those? How do we teach them? And then finally, and this is an area that of course would have to be of great interest and concern to me since I'm trained as a technologist, how do we take the technologies like the ones we're using at the moment? Technologies that I'm now convinced and that I've tried to argue in these remarks were largely created to serve our more, faster, better agenda. Um, 
how do we take these practices and reconceptualize them, redesign them, and even use them differently so that they can be even more powerful tools for receptivity and engagement. <clears throat> so that's basically what I had to say. Um, I'll end my remarks here. Um, I will leave up as a last page uh, the set of references. Um, so if, if you want to copy down any of those that you didn't happen to get, I'll call your attention to two of my pieces. Um, one is the Google Talk that, that um, Beth mentioned uh, at the beginning which is available um, on YouTube. I notice I misspelled Google there, sorry. Um, but it's easy enough to get onto YouTube and if you, um, if you search for No Time to Think Levy, you'll find it pretty quickly. The other is a more scholarly piece, um, a journal article called No Time to Think, Reflections on Information Technology and Contemplative Scholarship, which is available and most of you can get it through your library or you can send me an email if you want a pre-publication copy. Um, the last thing I'll say by way of uh, conclusion is if any of you have thoughts about where these um, remarks might be published, I, I don't have a sense of a, of a journal or, or something else where I might write these remarks for, for broader publication, I'd love to hear it. Um, and so um, that ends um, the lecture part of this and I'm now going to turn to the, uh, to the questions from you. Thank you so much, David. It was so wonderful to have you take us through and all the, the research that you've done is just so illuminating um, for where we find ourselves in this predicament and, and the possi possibilities that are, that are there with it. Um, so we, we are opening up for questions now and any of the participants can, can type them in in the little question um, box and we'll take a look at those or if, if there are those of you who have a headset on with the mic or are listening over the telephone. Um, we'll take a look at the attendee list and see if your hand is raised. There's a little icon of a hand and if you click on that um, we'll know that you would like to ask a question or make a comment. Um, Great. Okay. So I actually am starting, um, Beth, I'm starting to see some questions. Okay. Great. Um, so, I, and I'll take the first one, which is from Nadine Cruz. Is contemplation the same as, as a way to think? Are they different? How are they related? That's a great question. Um, I'm sure many of the people who are part of this would also have interesting answers to this question. Um, I'll tell you how I understand this. And um, con contemplative practices, as I have come to understand it for myself, are a broad and, in a sense, open-ended set of te techniques um, that allow us to become more receptive, more quiet, and more open to something that's happening in the present moment. So a technique that so many of us have used in practice, which is simply sitting and paying attention to the breath, is a practice of coming back again and again to something, to the actual experience of breathing. In that practice, one is simply being receptive to um, the breath and, if, and thoughts may come and go, but one is not explicitly trying to think. Um, so thinking and contemplation are not the same thing. However, when we are trying to think about something, thinking is something we do in the present moment and only in the present moment. So that to the extent that we can actually quiet down and quiet the chatter of our mind, we're in a better, better position to actually um, to be able to think more clearly. Um, okay, um, let's see. I see from Alan Schusterman, um, I'd like to see this published in the popular press, not just the academy. This needs to enter into our culture more broadly. I'd love to have ideas from you, Alan, or other people about where it could be published. Um, next one, my colleague just told me about a talk she attended where the speaker explained how students' minds today really think differently than ours. How do we understand our students' mind geared toward multitasking and overstimulation and bring in contemplative practices at the same time? This is from Brenda Miller. Well, well that of course is, is such a great question and, and that's exactly in a sense, um, I, I heard you laugh there Beth, but probably that is in some sense what the, the, the new um, um, association for contemplative mind is really all about. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about my research regarding this. Um, over the last three or four years, I have been engaged in conversations with students at, at seven different universities at the moment. And I've been asking them questions like, do they ever feel like they spend too much time online? Do they ever feel the need to quiet down and slow down? 
And my so far informal results um, are amazing. It's that more than, it's that approximately 90% of the students, this is more than 300 students, say that they feel they're spending too much time online and that they feel the need to quiet down and slow down. So um, other people can answer whether their brains are wired differently, but I'm convinced that if we start having a conversation with our students, we will find a well of interest and concern um, among our 18 to 21 year olds about exactly these issues. Um, um, and then I see from Mitchell Silverman, uh, could you make your whole presentation available? I'm not sure what that means. Um, Beth, this will be available, um, uh, archived on the, uh, on the website. Yeah, right? we, we've, recorded, we've recorded this webinar, and um, yeah, that'll be free access posted on our website in, um, in a week or so after the, after the webinar. Okay, good, thank you. Um, yeah. And then I see a question from Al Kazniak, who is a good friend and collaborator at the University of Arizona, saying, so what are some of your ideas about how technologies can be applied toward more contemplative goals of higher education? Um, well, this is, you know, some of this is work that Al and I are actually engaged in. Um, it seems to me that, there, broadly speaking, there are two directions that we can go in. <clears throat> One is to actually develop, to, to redesign our technologies so that they actually have, um, a, a, that they're designed for um, um, a, a more contemplative approach to learning. Um, I mean, to give you an example by analogy, I mean, think about the difference in physical environments between um, uh, walking through a really noisy subway station versus um, uh, sit, sitting quietly in nature. Um, I think by and large, some of us, many of us will feel that the subway station makes us frantic and, and, is, and, and its noise is, is not an aid to being contemplative, whereas sitting in nature gets us quieter. Our screens at the moment, our, our, our technology, the way we design our technologies, they, they don't look and they don't feel very contemplative. Um, there are opportunities for us to design for that. The other thing that I think we can do is we can begin to figure out how to use the tools we actually have in a more contemplative way. Um, a Zen teacher that Al and I have been doing some experimental work with named Darlene Cohen has written a little book called um, The One Who Is Not Busy, which is really about how to train the attention in such ways that when we're doing email and when we're on the phone, that we can actually, um, we can still, under those ex circumstances of, of multitasking and stress, we can still calm our bodies down, calm our minds down, and be more contemplative. Um, so thank you for that, Al. Um, another comment is, should the references be posted on the webinar archive? That sounds like a good idea. Um, oh, here's an interesting one. Another one from Alan Schusterman. I'm worried about the having it all mentality here. I'll have 15 minutes for great contemplative practice. I, and by inference, my students have to squeeze it in between classes and meetings. How do we avoid that outcome? What is the alternative? Um, Helen, I'm, let me see. I'm not completely sure. I'm not completely sure I understand your question. It sounds like what you're saying is, so can we, can we possibly, are you worried that, well, we can do it all. We can, we, we can stay as busy as the culture is suggesting we are, but we can also be contemplative at the same time. Um, if that's your question, um, of course I have those concerns as well. Um, one of the things that, that, that is incorporated into my life is a weekly Sabbath, Shabbat practice. Um, my, my Jewish practice, my wife is a rabbi. It's really crucial to me to actually take time every week to be offline and to get quieter. And I don't think that most of us are going to learn how to engage in these kinds of contemplative practices unless we devote ourselves um, in concentrated ways, either by going on retreats or by taking time every day um, to quiet down and slow down. So no, I don't think that the ultimate answer is just going to be, I mean, in fact, it's one of the worries that I have uh, about, uh, about the way my remarks could be misunderstood. Um, I don't want us just to turn into more robotic multitaskers going faster and faster. Thanks to, thanks to contemplative practices. Um, next question this, um, is from Katie Egart. 
Um, boy, these are good and really hard questions. Um, <clears throat> if you were starting a liberal arts college from scratch, how would you integrate contemplative practice in the plan, curriculum, faculty selections? You know, um, I don't really think I'm going to be able to answer that in, in, in two minutes. I, 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 um, but I also suspect, and, and I'm pointing to you, Beth, or thinking that you might have something to say. There are many people part of the contemplative, larger contemplative mind community who've been giving a lot of thought as to how to integrate um, contemplative practices into the curriculum. And I think a good place to start is, is simply to go to the Contemplative Mind website. And I believe there are more than 100 curricula um, online from people study, to teaching English, art, chemistry, uh, you name it. Can you say something about that, Beth? Yeah, well, I think, um, of course, this is a, a blue sky kind of question, you know, to start from scratch. Um, and there, the, but there are many ideas and, and models that are, are being developed for transformation within the existing um, institutions. And, um, you know, there's so many different ways to go about it when, when there's real leadership from um, a, a place of mission and administration. Um, many things can happen um, very quickly uh, in terms of faculty groups and um, institutionalizing, you know, having a room dedicated for meditation or contemplative practice. Um, but then those things, if that, that really turned on administrator or leader moves on to, to something else, then those kinds of things, you know, haven't really rooted in the institution. Um, most of the, the way that we see it happening is through a kind of more grassroots, um, a group of faculty start to get some positive results, you know, with their students and attract some attention and, um, and grow it more, more from the ground up that way. But it's a wonderful question to entertain in that blue sky way as well, and um, I think it's a great topic for conversation. Yeah, I'd love to see us collectively find a way to have more of that, mm -hmm. that conversation. Um, the next question is actually um, related as well. It's from Deborah Haynes. Hello, Deborah, at the University of Colorado. Um, how do these ideas find form in your teaching right now? Could you give concrete examples? Um, sure. Um, let, let me say, first of all, that I am hardly a poster child for bringing all these practices into my teaching. Um, I did create um, a course called Information and Contemplation here at the University of Washington, um, which was a wonderful opportunity. Um, I have been slower to bring it into other teaching. In fact, I feel that I made a mistake a couple of years ago in bringing just some practices of silence into what was a core course in my teaching. Um, and I think that, I think, um, well, that's a whole longer subject about whether you, br to what extent you bring these practices in to students who really don't have a choice about whether or not they're going to be in your course. Um, I certainly made the, made, made the silence optional, but, uh, but I feel there may have been some backlash. But, but let me give one specific example of something that, I, that has been very successful in my teaching um, in, the, in the course that I created for the center. Um, I've created an exercise where I ask students over the course of either a day or a week to keep a log of their email behavior. And as they go online and as they spend time online and as they, as, as they go offline, I ask them to look at what's happening in their body and their breath and their mind and to keep notes about that. And then at the end of a week um, or however long the exercise has been going on, to look back over their notes and to see whether by bringing contemplative awareness to their email practice they've learned anything. And Every single student who has done this practice has come back with, with exciting um, discoveries. I mean, very commonly, people say, wow, I never realized that when I go online, it's often because I'm anxious or bored. And very often, when I, the more time I spend online, the more anxious I get. So there are all kinds of discoveries that people can make from them, for themselves by actually bringing contemplative awareness to their technology practices. Um, and, and of course, there are other examples I could cite. Um, Okay, and then Milton Schlosser says, one of my research projects is that of encouraging journaling in the context of music students, Slow, slowing them down, so to speak, using an online journal to reflect. Do you see technology and the contemplative tra traditions as necessarily opposite? Great, 
Great, great question. Um, you know, I think the deeper answer is no. I don't believe that ultimately technology and the contemplative tra traditions are necessarily opposite. I think that's a really important thing. However, if you, you know, if you believe the historical analysis that I've given, there is still in some sense a bias built into an anti-contemplative, um, <clears throat> an industrial era bias that's built into the current technologies. It doesn't have to stay there, I don't believe. Um, we can make changes, but we are carrying this heavy weight of more, faster, better. Um, it's not in the technologies themselves as much as it's in the entire worldview in which the technologies are embedded. Um, uh, I see Mitchell Silverman saying, I'm a reference librarian at a law school. I'm working on a paper about mindfulness as a technique to address librarian stress and burnout. I got the idea from similar use of mindfulness with lawyers. Could you briefly address some of the practical techniques you use to return to a contemplative state and their effects? Uh, one thing, Mitchell, you might want to know is that there is actually a project of the Center for Contemplative Mind that has been explicitly working with, with um, lawyers. Um, Beth, do you want to say anything about that? Yeah, the, the law program is pretty much based on the West Coast now, but um, there's information on our website on the contemplativemind.org website. Um, about an upcoming conference at uh, UC Berkeley. And so there are some things, some uh, networking and, and sharing of information there. Um, thank you. Um, the one other thing I would say, Mitchell, things, practices that I use most crucially in my own day have to do with simply returning to the body and relaxing. Um, and that means at times it is simply you know, sitting in front of my workstation and taking um, a couple of conscious breaths Another practice that's been very, very helpful for me is, in effect, doing walking meditation. When I stand up to walk down the hall, to really feel my feet and to relax, um, especially because um, of the training that I've been doing in Aikido, which is so much a body-oriented practice, I feel that there are certain things, like walking, that are almost a kind of mindful, mindfulness bell signal to me. To, to, to sort of let go of the, ch the chatter of my mind and whatever else was going on, and to just return to the present moment. Um, let's see, let me move on. Uh, ooh, an interesting one, Nadine Cruz. These are all great questions. Um, thanks, David. Your ideas motivate me to pursue these questions. How can contemplative and other thinking reflective practices, quote, improve the quality of actions of, quote, service and, quote, community engagement? How are current reflection, reflection practices in engaged pedagogies mirroring radical instrumentality? Boy, oh boy. That, I think, is such a deep and important question. And I, I have to, I simply really want to honor it and, and bow to it. I mean, what I hear you saying, which I am aware of, and, and confused about um, is the fact is that bringing in these practices as an antidote to radical instrumentality can themselves, it can in itself be another form of the same radical striving to get somewhere, right? I mean, I wish at this moment, Nadine, that we were all sitting in a big room together because I would turn to you or I would turn to other people in the audience and I would ask you, how are you dealing with this, what is, a, what is essentially a paradox? I, and something that I simply don't have a good answer to, but that I, that I think about just about every day. So thank you so much for bringing up that really important question. Um, let's see, Beth, how are we doing on time? Well, I think we have time for one more, if you see that there's one. And okay. all the questions will be available after the webinar. We have a printout, and so if there are ones that you'd really like to address and we just don't have time for, um, you know, you could do that, and we could we could post that along with the the archived webinar, the responses. Just so you okay. don't feel like you know, there'll be some that were are left unaddressed. Okay. Um, so I'm one last question from Richard Wilson. Um, what shifts do you see in the academy to relieve pressures to produce? Unfortunately, I don't see. <laughs> I, I this is something else. I wish I could open the room up to hear from other people. Um, these 10 years that I have been, almost 10 years that I have been an academic, I have actually seen nothing but an increase in the pressure. Um, and this is at a, 
and in my own local institution, the, the Information School at the University of Washington, I have a climate where we have a, a wonderful dean, Harry Bruce, who actually does believe um, in the importance of some of these practices. And yet, it isn't, you know, most of the pressure on us um, to produce, produce, produce at even faster rates is not simply up to the dean or the head of our department, but it's part of the very fabric. So I hate to end on a, on a negative note, but I, at the moment I don't see um, any, any, any concrete ways that are, that are being attempted to relieve the pressure. And, and yet that's the opportunity that I think we have by broadening um, this conversation across the country and across the world. And on that hopefully more positive note, um, I will end. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, David.